evening. Um, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to the first event in the fall 2019 series of the City Talks on the theme of politics and the city. My name is Dana Zumsal and I am a lecturer at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Victoria and a member of the UV Committee for Urban Studies which runs the City Talks. I'd like to begin by first acknowledging that this event is taking place on the traditional territories of the Nekwangan peoples, as well as acknowledge the Songhees, Aspimolt, and Wasanich peoples, whose historical relationships with the land continues to this day. I'd like to thank also to, for financial support of the Faculty of Social Sciences, as well as the Departments of Geography, History, Political Science, and Environmental Studies, and the Gustafsson School of Business, which have supported the City Talks this year. And uh, thank you to Legacy Gallery for providing us with the space. This year marks the 10th anniversary of the City Talks lecture series, and if you're interested in supporting us uh, as a donor or co-sponsor, uh, we encourage you to visit our site, thecitytalks.ca, uh, for more information. Tonight's City, Talk event, City Talks event will be a panel discussion on the 2019 federal election and the political stakes for Canadian cities, with four federal candidates running for election in Victoria. So I'd like to introduce them to you. Uh, Laurel Collins, NDP candidate for Victoria Electoral District. <laughs> Russell Coy, Green Party candidate for Victoria Electoral District. <laughs> Nikki McDonald, Liberal Party candidate for Victoria Electoral District. <laughs> and Jordan Reichardt, Animal Protection Party candidate for Victoria Electoral District. <laughs> I'm honored to moderate tonight's uh, panel. Each panelist will have 10 minutes uh, for their opening statements. When all panelists have spoken, we will have a Q&A session. And I'll ask panelists to restrict their answers for two minutes. Uh, so let me introduce you to our speakers today. Uh, Laurel Collins, NDP candidate, is a longtime Victoria resident, community organizer, and city councillor. She taught courses at UVic uh, in social justice studies, social inequality, and the sociology of gender. She worked as program coordinator at Victoria Women in Need and co-published a book in 2015, Women, Adult Education, and Leadership in Canada. In 2017, she won a Victoria Community Leadership Award in Sustainability and Community Building. Her priorities include tackling the housing crisis, universal health coverage for all, and climate leadership. Russell Coy, Green Party candidate, was born and raised in British Columbia <coughs> by her Dutch immigrant father and her Schwebmann Stadlian mother. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole mouthful of indigenous. <laughs> Russell is a member of Samakwam First Nation, she is a community outreach specialist with 20 years of expertise in communications, government, and media relations. Russell has represented First Nations people and cultures of the world in English, French, and Spanish as regional, national, and global platforms like the Cannes International Film Festival and the inaugural live broadcast launch of Aboriginal People's Television Network. Her priorities include tackling climate change, care for mental health issues and addiction, and economic growth. Nikki McDonald, Liberal Party candidate, served as a senior advisor to Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, and her experience spans industry, government, and academia. Through her PhD research at the University of Victoria, she explored the importance of incorporating diverse voices, as well as indigenous values and ways of knowing into ocean policy and governance. Her priorities include addressing climate change, the rising cost of living, and adequate access to healthcare. And finally, Jordan Reichardt, Animal Protection Party candidate, was born and raised in Victoria, BC. Jordan is a mental health and addictions worker, animal advocate, and community organizer. 
Jordan has worked as a marine electrician in the service industry for the Victoria Cool Aid Society and has been employed at Island Health as a mental health and addiction worker. After 2015 federal election, Jordan became the deputy leader of the Animal Protection Party of Canada and is employed by the Animal Alliance of Canada. His priorities include to bring an animal inclusive perspective to politics and social policy that puts the needs of people, animals and the environment first. So without taking too much time, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Laurel Collins. Flag that I will start shaking after 10 minutes. So, <laughs> thank you, Denise, and thank you, Ruben. Uh, thank you all for being here. So, my name is Laurel Collins, uh, and I am the NDP candidate for Victoria. And I am just incredibly grateful to be with all of you here today on the homelands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. And this topic, the future of cities, it is extremely important to me. I am a Victoria City Councillor. Uh, I also sit on the CRD's Regional Water Supply Commission. I'm on the uh, Greater Victoria Harbour Authority. And I also sit on the Green Municipal Fund, a federal body that gives out millions of dollars to municipalities to work on projects that will dramatically decrease our greenhouse gas emissions or restore our ecosystems. You know, I have been working on these issues for decades. I'm an instructor at the University of Victoria in social justice and social inequality and the issues, you know, the most important issues in this election, the climate crisis, the housing crisis, growing inequality, you know, these all have, you know, profound connections to the future and to the well-being of Canadian cities. And you know, also, most Canadians who are going to vote in this upcoming election live in cities. And so, as a highly urbanized country, and one that is growing more so by every passing year, you know, we need to acknowledge that the policy development, uh, the policy execution, both at the provincial and federal levels, you know, it has its greatest impact here in cities. And I have seen this firsthand, and it is why we need a strong federal partner that will work with cities on these issues. Because now, more than ever, we need that partnership. If we want to tackle the climate crisis, you know, that's the issue that got me involved in politics. Uh, cities are actually responsible for half of the greenhouse gases that are emitted in Canada. And the city of Victoria takes that responsibility very seriously. On the council, I have championed climate action. And as soon as the IPCC report, the UN climate report, came out, it was last year, at that point it said we have less than 12 years to meet our climate targets. And so I put forward a motion to city council to accelerate our climate leadership plan. And it passed through council, our staff is working on that, we've had three workshops, and you know, I'm extremely proud of the work that we're doing. But this is the point that I want to make. You know, without federal government support, cities cannot adequately, adequately address the climate crisis. You know, cities don't have the financial room and they don't have the legislative authority to actually tackle this on their own. On the housing crisis, you know, this is probably the number one thing that I hear on the doorstep. I've been out every day and people are worried about being priced out of the city. And if we have a city, you know, if only the wealthy can afford to live here, what kind of city is Victoria? It's not the kind of city that I want to live in. Diversity, uh, both economic and social, it is what makes our communities vibrant. It's what makes them interesting, and it's what makes them progressive and inclusive. And so, you know, it is so important that we take the housing crisis seriously. I also want to talk about infrastructure. Uh, two thirds of Canadian infrastructure is in cities, and it is actually the lifeblood of our economy. 
you know, upgrading and building new infrastructure, whether it is affordable housing or new transit projects or building retrofits, you know, this is what keeps our cities livable. Uh, it also is incredibly important for reducing inequality and incredibly important when it comes to tackling the climate crisis. You know, I could go on and on and on about all of the challenges that cities face, um, poverty, homelessness, and the opiate crisis. And it is because I think all of these issues are actually connected. You know, and that acknowledgement of the interconnection of all of these issues is at the foundation of the NDP's plan that we have put forward for this country. I think it is what makes our vision different, and if I may say so, better for Victoria and for Canada. The NDP's New Deal for People, it is a bold plan to tackle the most important issues in this election. And I just want to touch on a few of its commitments. On the climate crisis, it has massive investments in clean en energy and green infrastructure. It has retraining for workers. We have committed to getting all of our buildings energy efficient by 2030, retrofitting uh, buildings. And we're also going to work with the provinces and with municipalities to build towards fare free transit. You know, this is something that the city of Victoria has uh, led on with free transit for kids. And with a federal partner, we could extend that to seniors, to low-income people, and then to everyone. You know, we also need to expand our transit routes and electrify our fleet. So these are just a few of the commitments in our plan, uh, and they are aimed at substantively reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, something that the Liberals have failed to do. And I think this is really important to note that our plan <coughs> has these reductions backed by legislation. And so the NDP is the only party that has committed to legally binding emission targets. Uh, so we will also establish interim targets and a climate accountability office uh, to make sure that we are tracking and keeping government accountable for climate action. On housing, you know, it has been decades since we have seen adequate investments in housing. And we are going to change that. We will partner with municipalities and provinces to build half a million new affordable units, much needed affordable housing, uh, affordable rentals, social housing, cooperatives. Um, and while we're talking about building new infrastructure, I also want to say that we are going to leverage uh, federal dollars through community benefit agreements and we are going to guarantee good jobs you know training and apprenticeships and we're also going to have support for local businesses and this is all vital if we want our communities to thrive and then finally central to everything that we do is reconciliation with indigenous peoples and the NDP is fully committed to implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and working with Indigenous people to co-develop a national plan on reconciliation. You know, the city of Victoria has, um, for the first time in its strategic plan, incorporated uh, the objective of reconciliation and Indigenous relations. And they are embarking on an Indigenous-led process uh, that involves witness reconciliation dialogues, and I believe that every level of government needs to be engaged in this work in a meaningful way. I'm really proud of the commitments that the NDP has made on reconciliation, and this didn't just start with this year's election platform. The NDP has taken a consistent and determined approach uh, for a very long time, and it was Romeo Saganash, our incredible NDP MP, who put forward the motion, the legislation, uh, to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And it actually made it all the way through Parliament and then was squashed by unelected Conservative senators. So these are just some of the highlights and the commitments in our platform. You know, they are all 
aimed at building stronger, you know, more resilient, more sustainable, and more inclusive communities across our country. And cities are at the center of our agenda because we know that most Canadians live in cities and this is actually where we can see the impact of good and bad decisions. You know, as a city councillor and as an educator, I have seen these challenges firsthand and I know how important leadership at the federal level is. It is why I'm in this race and it is because the stakes are so high. You know, the decisions that we make now are gonna have lasting impacts for future generations. For Victoria, for Canadian cities, and for our country. So I am really looking forward to the discussion tonight. I wanna just thank you again, all of you, for being here and engaging in these important topics. Thanks. Just want to be really respectful of your time. I'm a little bit taller than the average bear. <laughs> I come to you today as Rasel Koy, also known as La Loya. I come to you from the Statley and Mishawakwa nations of British Columbia, as well as Dutch heritage from The Hague. I come to you today as someone who really understands how Victoria has been and continues to be a refuge for the very first peoples who interacted with the Lekwungen speaking people when they were welcomed here, when we had the forts here, when we had a development here and there was a relationship here the very first time of settlers and indigenous people. I'm somebody who came here on the heels of the first mega wildfire. The 2017 mega wildfires that came, there was lightning strikes that literally went around my house. Climate change came knocking at my door. And it's something I found very humbling, because I went away for the weekend. I went to a powwow. I had my cedar hat, I had my regalia. I happened to just throw in my computer. And I was a climate displaced person, or some may say a refugee, for 40 days. Now, first world problems in Canada. I'm gainfully employed, I have friends and family who took me in easily and well. And I also was able to get by with my computer and Wi-Fi and continue to earn my living. After the wildfires, when I went back home to lands of my grandfather's people, and I saw the home of our moose and our deer and our salmon and all the creepers and crawlers and the swimmers in the, in the waters be so disturbed by the wildfires, I just felt so devastated by it, I knew it was time to move. So I turned to Victoria because it was a place where I could afford to live. It was a place where I knew it was a cultural hub. I knew it was a place of strong education, great post-secondary institutes, and I knew that it was a place that offered that breath of the Salish Sea. And I could find ease in my heart again and continue to contribute locally, nationally, and internationally. So that's why I chose to come here. So when I think about cities, I think about how each and every city needs to be welcoming to everyone, whether somebody displaced or having to leave their hometown in search of work or higher education, pursuit of a dream, or in some of the cases for my family members, sometimes they have to leave because of chronic illness, that they can't get the services provided to them in the rural areas, so they have to come to larger cities so they can be close to the dialysis or the um, chronic uh, treatment that is needed for their um, illnesses or other things. I also know it's a place where we need to be able to welcome people that they can thrive, 
in a way that makes sense to them, that they see themselves reflected in the fabric, that they're not struggling with the very basic things. When I think about a city, we think about a hub, we think about activities, we think about transit going out to different places, we also think about the very basic thing, which is safety and well-being of everybody found there. And safety and well-being comes first and foremost, as my colleague has said here, I say colleague because I feel like we're all in a race, we're all in this together, um, is at the doorstep, each and every one, I'm sure, has been hearing about housing and affordability. When I have the opportunity to knock on a house, generally speaking, that's a person talking to me from a place of privilege, where they're able to either afford the mortgage or the rent of that home. They may not be concerned about their immediate needs, but they're concerned about their children, they're concerned about their neighbors, they're concerned about the people on Pandora Street, they're concerned about everybody around them. And we know that housing, that very basic need, needs to offer safety and well-being. It is the very first lifeline into somebody's road to recovery from opioid crisis or any matter of addiction, also for the mental health and well-being of people. We're now talking about terms of eco-grief. We're talking about people who feel so devastated by what's going on, they're rethinking about whether or not they're going to have children, what they can do, how can they think of going forward. So we know that they're concerned in all these matters. When I look at our Green Party platform, I'm really delighted that every aspect in that Green Party platform goes has climate crisis at the center, because if we don't have the clean air and the clean water, how are we going to get ahead? So even though we are, by and large, urban people, 50 or 70 percent, depends on numbers, we know that we are ever-expanding urbanization going on. We know that there's so many needs that we have to meet. We also know that we have United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and we are integrating those into our platform. And there's very clear targets by the best scientists, including some in our own backyard, such as the BC Green leader, Andrew Weaver, has been part of those IPCC uh, reports. who are telling us we are some very specific targets we have to hit by 2030 and 2050. And we plan on hitting every single one of those, but we need your help. And more importantly, it's not for you to carry that burden yourselves as individuals. It's the collective of us. So it's not just a you, it's a us that we need to lift that forward. And we can do that with cities by exemplifying how we engage, how we transform industry, how we retrofit, how do we make our buildings more energy efficient, how we go into renewables, whether it's individuals putting solar panels on their houses to uh, the cruise ships getting plugged in and not running their, their, um, their dirty diesel that's just filling James Bay and our neighbors with uh, all sorts of pollutants. But we understand that we need to find solutions to move forward to meet those needs. We also know that as far as I'm concerned, and as far as the Green Party is concerned, housing is a human right. We need to be able to go forward in a good way so that everybody can be safe. We also know that creativity is needed as we go forward. When we look at artificial intelligence, when we look at the transformation of our industries, we look at engagement, we know that people need to be able to find their foot forward, and we need to make sure that they're engaging on their path to happiness, that their pursuit of a better day in schooling, in education, in apprenticeship, is at their fingertips. Because we know if they're engaged to go forward, we're a better society for it. And I just think, Every person who comes here needs to feel welcome, supported, enriched, and ability to give back to each other. There's a very um, basic premise to the teachings from my grandfather's people. It's one of our very first teachings, and that's the teaching of reciprocity. Reciprocity sounds very simple, but to me, when I think about reciprocity, it is my interrelationship 
to me, to you, to the land, to the water, to the peoples of this land, to Victoria, to the outlying communities, to Vancouver Island, British Columbia, to the neighboring provinces, to the territories, to our neighbors to the south, to the world. How are we making the world a better place? We all know there is no planet B, and we have a responsibility as Canadians with our first world problems to address inequities that come up around the world and in Canada, that we are opening our doors in our cities because we know that that's the best place and best catchments for new Canadians to come and do well, just like we want people who are already here to continue to succeed. Thank you very much. Hi, so we were asked as part of this 10 minutes uh, to give an introduction to ourselves and say a little bit about why we're running for office. So I thought I'd start there and then talk a little bit more about why I think this election is pivotal for cities in particular. So who am I? I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a Labrador owner, I'm an environmentalist with a deep passion for the ocean. I'm also a pragmatist, and I have a record of getting things done. The reason I put my name on the ballot is because I felt it was important to give a voice to the ocean as a cornerstone of dealing with the issue of climate change. As a researcher and as somebody who's been involved with the oceans for over a decade, and as an advisor working with government to find better ways to manage the Salish Sea, I observe that we often talk about fisheries or we talk about marine, but we don't as often talk about the ocean as an ecosystem. And I think that's a very important focus that we need to bring out. The other reason I'm running is that to give Victoria a direct voice in government. We've had a habit over the past decade of voting ourselves into opposition. But as someone who's worked and served in Ottawa, I can tell you I understand what the impact is of having a member of the governing caucus as your representative. To be able to secure opportunities for Victoria, to help grow the economy, and to help fund, find the resources and build the partnerships to address the societal issues that we're facing, such as homelessness and addictions. I also want to be a strong voice to stand up for equal rights and for respect and tolerance. As a mother of two daughters, I am deeply concerned about what an Andrew Scheer government would mean for women for equality rights. I'm concerned about what it would mean for respect and tolerance for diversity. During my time working in Ottawa for Monsieur Chrétien, as well as a, as a young girl working for my fa with my father, who was a member of Parliament and a member of Trudeau's cabinet, here Trudeau's cabinet, I saw firsthand how you can work across the aisle, how you can work with members of the, of the House of Commons from all parties to be able to solve problems together. I believe that you can do that with a voice of respect and a voice of tolerance. I think this is a pivotal election for cities. First of all, climate change. We really can't wait to address on climate change. And there's no more issue that's more important to our future. Cities need to adapt and mitigate climate change, and I compliment Mayor Lisa Helps and Laurel and her colleagues for building a climate action plan for Victoria, for its working in partnership with the provinces and the territories and the cities that we all together can fight climate change. I'm proud of, of Justin Trudeau for his leadership in putting a price on pollution and going across this country and negotiating agreements with provinces and territories to put in the carbon tax. I'm happy and proud that he made the investment of $1.5 billion through the Ocean Protection Plan 
And what that meant for me as a Goshen researcher was going from a Harper era where there were only eight people doing ocean policy in fisheries and oceans to where there was a significant investment not only in the government of Canada, but investment in partnerships with third, third parties, including at Ocean Networks Canada, where I worked. I was also proud of the action he took to ban harmful single-use plastics by 2021. And for those who uh, follow the ocean and ocean issues know how detrimental plastics have been. He's also invested in better transit in communities across Canada. He supported renewable energy and invested in ener energy efficient buildings, as well as passing an important declaration of the national climate emergency. He has also passed the rebates on electric cars. And in British Columbia, combined with the, the BC rebate, rebate, that makes electric cars far more accessible for British Columbians. The other key issue, of course, is housing. And I'm very proud that this, the Liberal government was the first government in over four decades to put a national housing strategy together. And that housing strategy is built on four pillars. The first pillar is the building of new housing through, um, through agreements, through co-ops, uh, through agreements with the partners of the provinces and municipalities. The second uh, pillar of that national housing strategy is the repair of existing stock, because a significant amount of the stock was, was made, was built in the 70s and the 80s. The third is providing the benefits, that, that leverage, that touch-up point to help those Canadians who uh, can want to get into home ownership or for Canadians who are unable to get into rental, that Canadian housing benefit that helps them get into that, that place. And the third, or the fourth, of course, is housing in transition. I was meeting with Andrew Vaughan, who's the parliamentary secretary, who's been responsible for really the design behind the housing strategy. And as he noted, homelessness is not a housing issue, it's a health issue. But in order to address the health issue, the mental health issues and the addictions issues, you need to give people a safe place to live, a sense of home security. And so that's why it's not only being addressed as a housing issue, but also through health. The last is I'm very proud of Victoria. I, I'm amazed in the decade plus that I've lived here to see how it's growing. I think it's just an amazing city. The tech sector is growing, small and medium-sized enterprises. I met with the head of Tectoria the other day. He noted that many of those uh, small and medium-sized businesses are actually selling to the world. They're global companies based out of Victoria. He described Victoria as a magnet city, which it truly is. It's a beautiful place to live. And many of those entrepreneurs have the opportunity to move to other locations to work. That's the nature of their business. And they choose to live here because it's a wonderful and beautiful place to live. That said, as we grow, we also have increased challenges of traffic congestion and our infrastructure aging. I'm very proud that the Liberal government has made and will continue to make investments in the Physical Infrastructure Fund, where they'll partner with the provinces, and the territories, and with the cities in building critical infrastructure such as roads, bridges, and others. They've also recently, we heard the announcement of new electric vehicles here in Victoria funded under a federal fund. So in, so in conclusion, I guess I'd say three things uh, about why I think it's important to think about choosing the Liberal Party as the next representative for Victoria. The first, as I said, is choosing somebody who could be in government, in the governing caucus, has great value in terms of being able to attract resources and getting things done for Victoria. The second is that we've already seen from the Liberal government over the last four years, the investments they'll make in infrastructure, in housing, in addressing issues like opioid uh, addiction, 
and uh, we would like to see that momentum moving forward rather than going backwards with an Andrew Scheer government. And the third reason I hope is a personal one for me, which is I hope you will put your confidence in me because I really believe that Victoria is on the cusp of growing uh, even more through small and medium-sized enterprises such as under the tech industry as well as social innovation activities that are going on in the city. So thank you. sociology and philosophy and have spent over a decade looking at mental health and addictions for Island Health and before that Victoria Kool-Aid Society. I'm the co-founder of the Vancouver Island Vegan Association, the Victoria Horse Alliance, and work for the Animal Alliance of Canada. I became involved with the Animal Protection Party of Canada in 2015 when I ran in my first federal election. I had no political experience, but I also realized that this was an advantage as I had nothing to lose and was able to speak authentically to the issues the other parties would not touch. We are, after all, the only political party to give equal consideration to animals, people, and the environment in our policy. While I have considerable more political experience this election, the basic principles are the same. We have a number of elected political parties that want to carry on status quo politics in a world that is literally burning for a revolution in how we think act and speak politically. I have no confidence in the mainstream politics that exist, so we are creating a new stream of politics we like to call compassionate politics. We need our politics to be about empowering people to create a world we can live in, and I don't mean buying electric cars and fluorescent light bulbs. This inconvenient truth-based policy is the greenwashing of capitalism that we must be done with. with. It has failed. We need to uproot our economic structure and shake out the dead weight of neoliberal market-based economics. The climate crisis we face will not be solved by a system that wants infinite growth in a world of finite resources. We will not house people with the crumbs of a commodified real estate market that sees housing as a place to maximize profit and not as a human right. We must decommodify housing. We certainly will not create a society that respects nature and recognizes the personhood of non-human animals as long as we subsidize the cruel and exploitative animal agriculture system to the tune of six to eight billion dollars annually. We must end animal agriculture. This does not even speak to the fact that climate breakdown is not some singular force we must reckon with. Currently, one million species face extinction in our world and the three main causes are the destruction of habitat, the exploitation of organisms, and then climate change. Even if we can limit temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, if we do not address animal agriculture and the destruction of nature, we will have not have the ecological systems functioning to sustain us. These are just some of the truths that the status quo political parties will not address. I am here before you because the urgency of the existential threats we face are profound and require profound responses. Enough with cliché, bold, and courageous rhetoric. It is time for a revolution of mind in our social and political world that uproots the deeply set belief that we can spend our way out of this crisis. We can afford nothing less than an upheaval of our comfort and apathy. Our politics must adapt and breathe life into the social organism it guides and which is currently under attack. So what does this mean for cities? Because that is why we're here after all. Cities are the vortex around which the global marketplace operates. The UN recognizes that by 2050, nearly 70% of the global population will live in cities. Because people demand materials and goods from far beyond, beyond what the city itself can provide internally, this must be the place uh, where we transform our behaviors in the interest of the world that sustains us. 
It means that cities must transform themselves from instruments of, globalized, of a globalized consumer market and into places of resistance to them. Something that is often forgotten in the discourse of climate breakdown at the political level is that it is the exploitation and destruction of nature, animals, and people from the movement of goods around the world that undermines our ecological and social integrity. The problem is systemic and will not be solved by investing deeper into a market-based economy or further deregulating what is already running rampant. We must reimagine our cities in the context of organisms themselves that consume and generate waste. This is in fact our urban metabolism, or the linking of material flows with ecological and social processes. This is something that is generally absent in the planning and governing of our cities. It is taken for granted that things are provided to us through the marketplace, and as long as shipments keep coming in, there is little concern. However, without knowledge of the sourcing and impact of the materials we bring into the city, or the disposal and waste generated when we consume that material, we are acting unconsciously towards the disembodiment of nature as an inexhaustible provider of wealth and goods. One fundamental shift we can make to address our place as a global contributor to these exploitative processes is to localize. This does not mean someone orders in electric cars and fluorescent light bulbs from afar and then sells them locally. This means establishing a local or complementary currency that is only good for purchasing locally produced goods within a certain geographic area. It is exchangeable for traditional currency, but incentivizes people to create a local marketplace marketplace that undermines the flow of global goods. The city must become the centrifugal point of a behavior shift with global consequence rather than merely being acted upon by the global economy. Another direct way we can address the city's con contribution to climate breakdown on a global scale is by shifting towards a plant-based society. Dairy, meat, fish, and eggs are some of the most destructive products on the planet and cities are the primary consumers of these products. As a leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions, the destruction of nature, <clears throat> and systemic cruelty, animal agriculture must be phased out and starting at the city level. This means educating educational campaigns, incentives for local businesses to stop serving animals, and divestment from these damaging and exploitative industries. If there is one thing that each and every one of us can do as individuals to preserve this world, we can start by going vegan. Last week, my colleagues and I were at an all candidates listening session hosted by the city, the chamber, DVBA, uh, and others. Uh, we talked about the labor market, child care, transportation, affordable housing, reconciliation, and climate change as issues affecting the city. While the panelists all focused on the need for more funding in these areas, I asked whether the panelists believe meaningful change could be achieved within the same economic structure which has failed to address these issues for decades. Their answer was the fallback of the neoliberal platform, rational choice theory, or that we are inherently rational actors and a market-based system will guide us towards the solutions we need because it will be in everyone's best interest. The problem with this, of course, is that markets only care about profit. And as long as growth and profit is the driving force of our economic and social policy, it will continue to undermine our ecological and social integrity to maximize its return. These are not the ideas floating around mainstream politics. These are just some of the ideas with the potential to revolutionize mainstream politics. The consequences for this city would be transformative, as it would, be fundament as it would fundamentally change our relationship with the natural world provide more economic autonomy, and undermine the exploitative systems we currently over-rely on for consumption. These changes are people-powered. They are about the decisions that you and I make every day. This is what a political party should be, not an exchange of a vote for a solution to all, the social and, all of our social and global problems. That is a lie. It should be a partnership to create a framework that people can participate in to make their lives and the world better while achieving their personal and interpersonal goals. I will not promise you that it will be easy, but the decisions we need to make should not be based on their ease. They should, must be based on the capacity for them to reshape our social and political world into regenerative processes that flow with our local and global economy, not against it. Thank you very much.
audience for questions. Uh, our speakers will have two minutes for each question. So if you have a question specifically to one speaker, please state that when you're asking your question. Okay. <laughs> Sound has got to go first. Oh, you can, you can. That's okay. I, I hate it when I can't hear people's oh, okay. questions, so I'm going to say thank you to the gallery. This is just terrific to be able to hear these people. I had no idea who was running. I'm really glad I do now. Um, I didn't come with an open mind. I decided uh, two weeks ago I was going to vote Green. I usually vote NDP. I voted Liberal last time, and at one point in my young life, I was the Vice President of the Conservative Party of um, <laughs> Saskatchewan. <laughs> that has mental health and opioid addiction in, and you say um, that we have to address the crisis. we have got to look at harm reduction, treatment, and prevention. And I want to hear how you're going to do that. I have four kids and four grandkids. And by the way, if I was 25, I would never have children now in this world. But um, one of my kids didn't call me on his birthday. He has mental health problems. He has been self-medicating for probably 20 years, and he didn't call me, so I guess he's incarcerated again. This is really tough stuff, and he's a really good kid. I mean, I like him a lot, but I'm really interested. What are we going to do? First, I really want to acknowledge uh, Jordan's dedication uh, at the front lines of this. Yeah. Um, because I know you've likely served some of my cousins in the work that you do. And I know that I'm not a frontline worker, I'm not uh, even a policy analyst on this, but I'm somebody who has unfortunately lived this again and again. Uh, I'm very open to the fact that I lost a brother to heroin overdose. I just lost a cousin here in Pandora, I lost another cousin in uh, Thunder Bay. It's, I'm uh, in my indigenous communities in our First Nation. We lose so many, one in four affected is First Nations or Métis or Inuit. So we know we need to get somewhere for everybody. We know there's no such thing as a safe supply right now. There are more overdose, accidental overdoses than there are uh, car, uh, people dying from car accidents in British Columbia. There is a public health emergency going on right now. We know that it needs to be a national health emergency around the opioid crisis. And I also know that we need to decriminalize illicit drugs because we need to be able to help people where they're at and where they're going. If you mentioned um, a child who's struggling, uh, as I say, self-medicating, self-soothing, whatever term you want, it's quite often it's mental health and addiction together. And we need to be able to treat them where they're at, wherever they're at on the road to recovery or at least harm reduction. So for me, it's about decriminalizing illicit drugs. It's about making sure that the supports are offered so that the, the awesome drugs of the world have what they need at their fingertips to support people wherever they're at. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I would like to hear from you. I've got two part questions. I'll ask the first and then ask you a question for you for as you know, it's been to ask your second question. Do you have any idea what the housing shortage is across Canada today? How many millions or about hundred thousand of units are short in housing today? Thank you all talk about housing shortages and mm -hmm. short. So we not have are we short ten houses or twenty thousand houses or hundred thousand or million? I don't know if it's that simple a response. Um, so, oh, that's okay. No. I think there, yeah. can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, so the way that uh, we've approached housing is, as I mentioned, is fourfold. It's um, getting um, increasing the stock, housing stock, so in, increasing the number of housing uh, units that are available. 
repairing the existing housing that we have in place today, helping those who are in rental housing today but are on the cusp of being able to move into an owned home, so the first time buyers benefit, so helping them move from a rental housing into, a, uh, into an owned home. And then the fourth is helping those who are homeless today, who are living on the street with addictions issue, move into transitional housing where they can get the treatment and then move into further, more secure housing following that as well. Yeah, um, yeah. We in our plan, we have committed to build half a million new affordable units, uh, and that is not going to fully address the housing crisis. There are so many different interventions that we need, uh, and it isn't as simple as just knowing how many people currently aren't without a home, because we know that the housing crisis it is impacting people who are living on the streets. It's impacting people who are living in their cars, who are couch surfing because they can't find a, a place to live, but also it's impacting people who are just one paycheck away from lo losing the roof over their head. And <coughs> it's also impacting you know, my colleagues and friends who are moving out of the city because they can't afford, they can't afford to start a family or buy a home here. And you know, one of the things I think it's important to note about the Liberals' housing strategy is that 90% of the funding that's promised isn't going to happen until after the next election. Uh, so we need to actually address the housing crisis now. It is urgent. You know, this is an uh, issue I, before I was on council, I was doing housing advocacy and fighting against rent evictions in the city. Uh, but my first motion to council was to define what affordable housing is. Because up until that point, developers could call whatever they wanted mm -hmm. affordable housing. It could be a basement suite that's market rental, but because it's not a two bedroom, it's more affordable. Or it could be 5% below market value, which is not affordable to most of the people that I know. Uh, and so we tied it to income so that we fundamentally, people shouldn't be spending more than 30% of their income on their housing. And everyone should have a place to call home. Thank you. I just wondered, uh, climate, climate action is, is critical for me in, in this election. I just wondered, uh, there's no conservative representative here, but <clears throat> how, what would you, what messaging would you develop so that it's not a question of pipelines versus climate or oceans versus jobs or housing versus you name it. I'm not saying that that's any of the language that you're using at all. In fact, Rochelle, I think you were the closest who came to talking about transformational change, looking at it as an organic whole. But do you pro how would you propose to do that so that it's not a quid pro quo all the time? It's not a, if you support this, you must not support yeah. that. And taking it into a kind of a more of a macro discussion about this is a world issue, not, not a Victoria, not a BC, not a Canada issue. Oh yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much for that question. Um, we're the Green Party, so obviously climate action is central to everything that we look at. And we look very seriously and have adopted all those uh, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development goals into our platform and every piece we bring up whether it's housing or it's economy or it's uh, a just transition for the sunset industries like coal and fossil fuels that we are putting something forward that also is keeping in mind that it's not a trade-off. I don't believe you can seriously talk about a, um, climate action if you are made us all the owner of a pipeline. I don't think you can seriously talk about um, climate action if you're also supporting LNG, aka fracking. I think you need to be very true of what's going on and accept the fact that we need to get off of fossil fuels ASAP. There's lots of discussion. All of us brought forward great ideas on how to get that forward. There's lots of um, indications of what we need to do on that and we made it really simple to follow. It's a 20-point action plan. It's called Mission Possible and I invite you to check it out. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, so I agree with you. I think it's time we stopped looking at approaching this in a binary way. Uh, it's not the environment or the economy. It's both together. It's balancing both together. And certainly in the work that I've done around oceans, and you brought up the pipeline, so I'm really grateful you did. Um, the way I look at the pipeline is there's two parts to it. One is the land part and one is the marine part. I'm an ocean person, so I tend to separate things that way. But the land part right now, we have bitumen that's traveling by rail car, that's traveling by truck, and by twinning the pipeline, you provide a safer conduit for that bitumen to get to tidewater. The second on the marine side, and this is the area that I've been working on, is all vessels represent a risk in the Salish Sea. We have one, the Salish Sea is one of the busiest waterways in North America. And we know that it's freighters who are single out and carrying bunker fuel. We know it's the BC ferries, it's the tugboats, as well as the tankers. All vessels represent a risk. A risk as well to the orca. And this is the re some of the research we did with Ocean Networks Canada, where we were studying marine noise. We were actually had hydrophones on the ocean floor for the reason of studying what was the different dialects amongst the orca. And through that, we, under, we learned about the impact of marine vessel traffic on the orca and how they had to scream at each other to be heard. We took that information, that research, and gave it to Transport Canada so that they could make it safer for all vessels to move through the Salish Sea and avoid those areas where the orca were or slow down where the orca were because we know a quieter vessel means uh, a slower vessel is a quieter vessel. So to your point it, about it's not binary, we all rely on goods coming in by freighter. We all get on the BC transport, the tra BC ferries to get across to Vancouver and it's making vessel traffic, marine traffic safer for all of that. Thank you. I can go ahead and Yes, I just want to I just want to comment um, that uh, yes, I, I did bring up the need for transformative change uh, on the climate on climate breakdown, and did recognize that we need to start looking at our society and our response to uh, the climate breakdown and destruction of nature from an organic sort of organ, organic perspective, rather than um, looking thinking that it's something we can section off. Uh, as a separate part of policy, it's ingrained in every aspect of policy, and uh, you know there's there's no place for uh, pipelines to transport. And that really is it. So, it, it, it take seriously the issue of climate breakdown and the destruction of nature, and politicians have uh, well mainstream politicians have a, a really bad habit of picking safe animals that they like to protect like orcas or i don't know grizzly bears and things like that but when it comes to the pigs chickens and cows which are absolute which are one of the leading causes of greenhouse gas emissions in our world today and the destruction of nature including by the way the amazon's burning because of uh, cattle ranching down there and the destruction of the Amazon to feed those those cattle as well. Uh, you know, you have to wonder why this isn't on any of their platforms as something as a priority to address here uh, in Canada, um, to be global, le global leaders on this and take a much more organic perspective as to how we, we address uh, climate breakdown and the destruction of nature, which I mentioned uh, cannot be separated from addressing this issue if we want to move forward in, in, with meaningful change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see someone, a few of you at the back kind of uh, straining your neck, so I'm going to stand. You know, this, thank you for asking this question. Uh, the climate crisis, it's the reason I'm in politics. It is my top issue. Uh, and I often have people ask me, okay, why did you choose the NDP? And it is a lot because of what you're talking about. You know, when we, income inequality, inequalities in our world and the climate crisis are so interconnected. And we need policy responses that are interconnected policy responses. 
And, you know, I'm out door knocking every day. And when I door knock in a low income uh, apartment building, I don't hear climate on people's lips. I don't hear it at the top of their minds. They are worried about the rising cost of housing. They're worried about the fact they can't find or afford childcare. They're worried about their student debt. You know, we need to address these issues because climate does need to be on the top of everybody's mind. We are in a crisis and we are running out of time. And it, you know, I get teared up and emotional about it all the time. I also, I teach up at the University of Victoria and I have my students coming to me in tears. Uh, we are talking about social justice and environmental justice. And I had a young woman approach me at the break. She had tears in her eyes and she said, how do I study? How do I work on the issues that we're talking about when the scientists are telling me we have less than 11 years? Yeah. And it is her, you know, it is that fear. I share that fear, but it is, her leadership, she's organizing around climate strikes and it is the young people that we talk to, that is what motivates me to action and is why you know, I want to go to Ottawa to fight to make sure we have bold climate leadership, but we also are transforming our economy to make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. So we will have two questions and then uh, we'll turn to the panelists to answer. So instead of doing one to one, we'll go to. Okay. Please. Just a quick question, uh, maybe addressing uh, Ms. Collins. Um, I really appreciate that you brought up um, the implementation on the topic of ingraining climate action in other policy. Uh, you brought up the uh, importance of climate action with housing policy. I want to um, see if you can elaborate a bit more on that, um, especially in the of Victoria and uh, you know, um, uh, free, free market housing, which tends to. Um, This question is for Jordan. Uh, I'm wondering, you mentioned about approaching small businesses to try and get them to reduce uh, consumption of meat. Um, I'm a bit curious if you could elaborate on strategies for that um, or other strategies to like incentivize people to eat less meat. Okay, so Laurel, um, the first question. Absolutely. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you so much for asking that question. Um, there are some kind of straightforward ways that we're thinking about the interconnections, and that is that those half a million new affordable units are going to be built to the highest energy efficiency. You know, we know that across Canada, buildings are our third highest emitters of greenhouse gases. We need to rapidly retrofit all of our buildings. You know, we need to be thinking about when we haven't seen adequate investing investments in housing in decades. We used to have investments in the 70s and 80s, and we've had a little bit in the past couple of years, but nothing compared to what we used to and nothing that is adequate to address the housing crisis that we are facing. Uh, we also need to be thinking about people who own homes. You know, when we're thinking about the fact that we have to rapidly retrofit all of our buildings, yes, you know, we can commit as a government uh, in investing in retrofitting our public buildings, but we need homeowners to also get on board and retrofit their buildings if we want to meet our climate targets effectively. And so, you know, most people who I talk to who are living in this city, uh, you know, maybe young families who are owning a home, they actually don't have $10,000 to switch their oil heat pump to electric. They don't have money to invest in solar panels or double pane windows or insulation. Uh, they are just struggling to pay for childcare and pay for uh, their mortgage and pay for all of the things that the really high cost of living here. And so what we have proposed is we're going to have a climate bank and whatever uh, the upfront cost of that retrofit, say they do solar panels or double pane windows, whatever the upfront cost is, it comes out of that climate bank. And whatever they save on their power bill cycles back into the climate bank. So they never pay a dime. And it's a very low interest loan, so it all just covers the admin costs. And the beauty of this, you know, we know we need to rapidly retrofit all these buildings. There is a barrier, and it's an affordability barrier. 
so we're going to come up with a solution that helps us get as rapidly as possible towards our climate goals. It also, after, say, it takes them five years to pay that off, uh, it makes life more affordable for them. They just start saving on their power bill. And it creates really good local jobs here in Victoria in the retrofit business. Thank you. Okay, Jordan, it's a... Thank you so much for the question. It's really nice to be asked a genuine question because often there's this tiresome thing of people kind of placing questions in the crowd with political parties and stuff. But <laughs> but um, but thank you so much. Um, yeah. So as, as in regards to transitioning people off um, meat and dairy and and those kinds of things and incentivizing that locally, well, I mean we have to look at it both uh, from both perspectives. So a huge part and something that I mentioned is that you know we, we actually subsidize. Uh, meat, the meat, dairy, and egg lobbies to the tune of about six to eight billion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. So, for perspective, that's uh, about twice as much as the oil and gas industry gets. Wow. So, they get about 3.3 billion a year. So, it's pretty horrific. We actually just gave 1.75 billion to the dairy industry, which, by the way, unless you're a baby cow, I don't think anybody in this room needs to drink dairy to be healthy or get calcium or protein or anything. I guarantee it, actually. Um, but the federal government just did that, the liberal government. So. Uh, you know, so that's a major issue because it actually falsely uh, subsidizes the costs uh, for the, of these products to consumers. Uh, meanwhile, I don't know how many of you eat your vegetables and such, but going to the grocery store and actually buying fruits and vegetables and whole grains and foods has become more and more expensive, especially if you want to buy organic products. And so, for some reason, eating healthful uh, food is more expensive than eating food that, in some cases, the uh, World Health Organization has labeled a carcinogen. Uh, and so why, why is this the case, right? So we need an, a shift in our, in our federal policy, the direction of where money's going. We need to bring down the costing of, all, of access to that food. Um, but of course, we actually need to change in our cities uh, the very idea of uh, what it is to consume. And uh, part of that, I, I think, is uh, in incentivizing the creation of local businesses to draw meat and dairy uh, products uh, from their menus uh, to switch to plant-based menus, uh, some th whether that's through, um, you know, I think we should directly tax meat, but I also think that we should offer tax breaks uh, and uh, other incentives to ensure that um, uh, these, these uh, plant-based businesses have a, a good starting point and, and, and more opportunity to establish themselves. Uh, we, don't, we do not need another business in Victoria that sells some fusion of anything to do with meat and dairy and eggs and whatever. Like, we're already overloaded with it. And this is the problem, is that we've been brought up on lies about the fact, about the idea that we need these products to be healthy, strong. In many cases, there's, there's a whole gendered aspect to it of being masculine. Um, we, and so we need to break down these barriers. And so that, that means educating people about, um, about the, the truth behind meat and dairy, the economic, the social, and the environmental consequences of it. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Yeah. 
a lot of the problem most of in it. a place of privilege for most of us when we consider global context. So, yeah, I'm just wondering what responsibility do we have to the rest of the world? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so for the first question, I'd like Nikki? to start. Yeah, yeah sure. So the first question, uh, just to remind ourselves, was about climate adaptation. What are we doing? Uh, what is the party's position in terms of climate adaptation? Uh, so we have woven that into a lot of our spending in terms of the physical infrastructure fund uh, because a lot of it is about building uh, in reinforcing seawalls, building better roads, better bridges, recognizing one of the things, for example, that I did up at the university was I was able to work with some of our researchers who were able to look at the forecasting 20, 40 um, and years out and longer so that when we're looking at making a major spend in infrastructure, what we can do is say, well, we have a good guess that this is there's going to be additional flooding here or there may be uh, an in increase um, of, of the increased sea levels. Um, that is also uh, what we did with Ocean Networks Canada. We've been monitoring, for example, uh, seismic activity, uh, and we're finding that there's, uh, an there's a lot of seismic activity going on. And so what do we need to do, for example, to plan for those kind of dramatic events that we know are a likely outcome of some of the climate change that's going on? So again, it's, it's investing through, through the physical infrastructure fund, through supporting the planning uh, of cities, uh, the planning of communities, putting in the regulatory actions so that we aren't building on floodplains or trying to open up those riverbeds that have been paved over so when there is, are the heavy rains and they come, that there is a place for the water to flow. Uh, and then educating people on how we as individuals really need to go about thinking about what do we be, need to be changing in our own space, in our own homes, in our schools and businesses to adapt to a changing climate. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thanks for the question. Uh, this is something that uh, when I was working on our strategic plan uh, at the city of Victoria, that I actually fought and you know pushed to make sure that we were uh, strengthening our climate policy on adaptation. It is something that our city is facing. I also sit on the Greater Victoria Harbor Authority uh, board, and it is something that we talk about all the time. And really, we also we're talking about needing support from the federal government uh, and. I'm really pleased that uh, adaptation is a big component of our uh, New Deal for the Climate, which is our plan called Power to Change. Uh, so we have commitments around making sure that we're actually investing in communities so that they can adapt to climate change, and that is rising sea levels, it is wildfires, it's looking all across our country and realizing also that you know rural communities are impacted by this as well. It's not just cities. Um, and I'm also excited to uh, answer the second question, so I'll wait for that. <laughs> yes, I think the essential component of um, climate uh, ad adaptation is recognizing that um, right now the way our cities are structured effectively works against the grain of uh, kind of the ecological processes that we're going to be facing uh, through climate breakdown. And so we really need to make sure that you know we're, we're I guess, um, uh, restoring some of our local ecology's ability to actually compensate for uh, the changes in maybe extreme weather that we face and that sort of thing, which you know may mean uh, you know greatly expanding our urban canopy, uh, for example, or uh, rewilding rewilding parts of our community that have essentially kind of been either taken over and a lot of it, a lot of our wild, like semi, you know, urban wild spaces are, you know, have become just tourist traps rather than actual spaces where um, nature can regenerate and uh, provide its ecological services that are necessary and that have, are obviously the main undermining feature of cities. And so what we need is to kind of create and move forward uh, with cities as um, processes that move with the ecological uh, flows that we face and are, we're going to struggle with. We're definitely not building any walls and so we actually need to build basically uh, tunnels 
um, for nature to, to move through us rather than us actually trying to be a force against it. Thank you. So when I think about climate adaptation and climate refugees, um, I, I want to just take you for a minute to what I've been doing the past number of years, and that's been as the bilingual co-chair of the Assembly of First Nations. You all know that First Nations, we hear about reconciliation, we hear about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the final report. We know that we have Canada set us up to be at disadvantage. So we are always stuck in a place of mitigation and adaptation to circumstances that were put on us. So I come to you as somebody who already has her sleeves rolled up and who has already been dealing with natural disaster, food insecurity, uh, housing crisis, and looking for economic growth. So when I look at all the things that we need to ad address for climate adaptation, I've been there doing that, looking at that. For example, when I talk about wildfire and being somebody who was displaced, what I did not mention was the fact that Part of that was I was at continued risk because after a wildfire, what do you have? You have continuous threat of flash floods. You have all sorts of disruption. And thank you for talking about the canopy and the use, uh, Jordan. Um, the carbon sink for the animals that help keep our, our ecosystems healthy. There is an interrelationship that when we're in urban settings, we forget. Fortunately, I haven't. Fortunately, any others have not. And we are at the front lines blocking things like the TMX pipeline to say, this does not make sense for where we need to go in the climate adaptation. And as well, when I look at climate refugees, and that's what I heard the question being, is we are the second largest country in the world. And we have the same population, more or less, of Mexico City. There are amazing people out there waiting to be awesome new Canadians. Let's welcome them here and make this a stronger Canada because we were founded on diversity and inclusion and it will make us better. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, sure, thank you. So one of the things I'm really proud of is this last year, uh, Canada welcomed the most refugees in the world of any other country. And those refugees are coming for many, many reasons. Uh, obviously, they're coming for political conflict, but political conflict is often related to climate as well, as there's a conflict over diminishing resources uh, in, their own, in their own communities. So I'm really proud that we continue to welcome refugees into Canada, as well as having a robust immigration system that encourages people to come here and to become Canadian citizens. The other aspect that I'm very proud of is one of the first things that Justin Trudeau did once elected Prime Minister was to take the global leadership position around climate and he went to Paris and he represented us there along with Catherine McKenna and Elizabeth Newey. Uh, and they made um, a strong case for not only how Canada would adapt to the changing climate, but how they would support developing countries and other nations make those adaptations. And to be able to mitigate some of the risks, some of the challenges that are leading to climate refugees. So I'm very proud that it's the twofold. One, we remain open, our doors are open to refugees who are coming here increasingly from, due to climate change, as well as continuing to support other countries to address those challenges. Thank you. Uh, I just, I really appreciate that you had asked this question. So I uh, did my master's in human security and peace building, and my research focused on climate migration. Uh, and so I was, you know, this was back in 2010, and <laughs> so it was a different world, but you know, still a really, really important issue. And I ended up working with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in Northern Uganda 
uh, working on internal displacement. Uh, but it is, this is an issue that's really dear to my heart. And we need a more fair immigration system. And uh, I am glad that we have let in more uh, refugees. And honestly, we are still keeping families apart. We still have uh, a safe third country agreement, which means that when people go to the US and are turned away, you know, the US is not a safe country right now. It's not. Uh, yeah. The NDP has committed to, you know, fixing the issues with our uh, refugee system, making sure those wait lines go down, abolishing the Safe Third Country Agreement, not actually signing on to that. Um, and then also, you know, we need to be thinking about how we create more welcoming uh, cities and communities. We need to actually welcome newcomers and immigrants. Uh, it's something that I am really proud of. Um, my council colleague, Shamarke Debo, has been working so hard to have a welcoming city strategy here in Victoria. And I think we need to be thinking about that across Canada. How are we really supporting the people who come? Because we heard uh, at that forum that um, was mentioned around um, the chamber and, and downtown business associations, yeah, they, they actually were talking about how immigrants are so needed. We have a labor shortage, and there are other parties, none of them luckily at this table, but who are gonna say uh, that we need to slow down immigration, that we need to stop immigration, uh, and that is not the mentality that we wanna have. We wanna educate people that newcomers are such a benefit to our community, and we need to really support them. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Canada brought in, uh, th I think, 350,000 migrants last year, and, and that's going to significantly grow in the coming years. I, I was just, I just heard on the CDC a couple days ago, I think, that uh, our, our population, which is you know, around 37 million right now, uh, could almost double by 2050 just based on migration. And a large part of that, of course, would be due to uh, uh, climate migration and um, the displacement of people due to uh, um, the effects of climate uh, breakdown. And, and we should be calling it climate breakdown, not climate change. Change is a soft word that doesn't really describe uh, what is actually taking place and, and the effects of it on, on the earth and people. Uh, I think that, um, you know, as Laurel mentioned, uh, it was brought up at the uh, All Candidates Listening, listening Session. Uh, uh, last week about um, you know the need for more workers and such. A lot of these people, of course, are going to want to come to our um, cities as hubs um, um, for education, um, for uh, training, for just accessing all the services for people new uh, to uh, the country. However, um, at the same time, you know we you know the Animal Protection Party of Canada is committed to. Um, protecting half of our natural uh, spaces, including half of our coastline from extraction and development. And so within that context, we really have to recognize that, you know, we also have to encourage people to move to uh, rural rural areas and we need to incentivize that uh, because if we just put everybody in the cities, it's going to be really, really hard on our ecosystems. Uh, the last point I'll make, make is that, uh, um, you know, in the context of um, labor, uh, migration and, and using people uh, who come and, and, and I, I think there's a real concern about the labor market and exploiting people uh, for cheap labor. We already have that problem in parts of Victoria and across Canada today and if we don't take the exploitation of labor as seriously as the exploitation of the environment uh, in general then um, and the crisis that bring people here then we're, we're going to fail to have a Canada that is inclusive and recognizes the importance of those people. Um, here in this country as well as much as they were in their own country. Thank, Thank you.
Laurel? Yeah, thanks uh, for the question. Uh, I do think it is important to note, you know, that those, those, the things that we're talking about when we're talking about decriminalization, uh, safe supply, you know, looking at the Portugal model to actually uh, address the immediate uh, crisis, it is so important. But I also love that you're thinking about long term and about really preventative care. I did a uh, tour. Uh, just a week and a half ago of Ustat, which is the urgent outpatient mental health care. And the admin staff there is stressed, the psychiatrists there, you know, they are doing such important work. And what they told me is, yes, they need uh, mental health funding. They want more funding for health, uh, absolutely. But they also want us to invest in child care. They also want us to invest in housing. Because when people are stressed out about their day-to-day -day lives, uh, when we don't have the services that we depend on, it is much more likely someone is going to have a break, like a mental health breakdown or uh, you know, relapse into addiction. And so they, the people I spoke to, you know, I was a little bit surprised. They were speaking to other aspects of our platform. When it comes to education in our uh, schools, you know, that is a provincial and school district uh, responsibility. And at the, at the federal level, uh, you know, we can provide funds transfers, uh, but we really need to advocate to those levels of government that can make the most effective change there. Thank you. Uh, Michelle. Thank you very much for your question. Um, one thing that I did not talk about is um, in our Green Party platform is something that I think is essential. Again, we know that jurisdictionally, municipalities are working directly with their, their residents, but they are getting a lot of directions from the province, and the province is getting a lot of directions from the federal government because it's about actual supports. And I think, this, I think of the very same thing with individuals. Individuals all on their own, how are they getting their needs met? It's the collective, how are we strengthening the family structures? How are we strengthening where they're going to school? How are we strengthening where they're being able to pursue um, their livelihood? And there's some very basic things that we've all talked about, like affordability. In our platform, um, and I think something essential that takes away a whole level of stress, whether it's economic or studies or any, anything, is a guaranteed livable income. When you know that your basic needs can be met and that you don't have, don't have to stress about keeping a roof over your head or the basic needs of yourself or your family looked after, that's number one. You can think beyond those three things that we always, the food and the shelter. Um, and so I, I also think about, as was mentioned before, parents being able to, or single parents being able to pursue gamefully what makes them happy, what gives them feeling like they're part of a society, but that they have the child care supports, and they have the transit that they need to get to where they're going, but they have the education as well, that they're coming home happy and inspired to engage. There's lots of things that hasn't been done in British Columbia. We know about a lot of it is provincial jurisdiction, some of it's municipal jurisdiction, but this is an all hands on deck moment where we need to make sure that we are creating the mental health supports necessary so that people feel that they can move forward in a good way and they're not being left all alone. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I agree that um, in terms of the youth, uh, I think that was your question, was about youth and avoiding getting into um, situations where they become addicted. The starting point is with children, obviously, children and families, and I'm, I'm really proud of my husband who's here, uh, who's a social worker and works with children and families, and he shared a story with me about a seven-year-old who came in to see him. And that seven-year-old had been having some mental health challenges, had been issues around anxiety. And when he came in to see him recently, he was a chipper little guy. And he, the, my husband asked him, why are you, what, what's, how are you doing? You know, what's going on for you? How are you doing? And the little guy said, I'm doing really well. And uh, he said, well, why? What's changed? And he said, I don't have to move. And my husband said, what do you mean you don't have to move? 
And his mother explained that because of the Canada Child Benefit, they get over $700 a month that now allows them to live in a safe, affordable housing. Prior to that, he had to move every year, or every couple of years, when she was unable to pay rent. And when he moved, he moved to school. And when he moved to school, he left his friends. So that is the seed or the beginning of providing that supportive environment. So for that little guy, he's becoming stabilized and he's being able to address his anxiety issues. The other thing that I think that I'm really proud the Liberals did, and I say this because I was on the front lines of fighting with the Harper government to get Suboxone launched in Canada. And I went to Tony Clement, who was the Minister of Health at that time, and I explained to him what Suboxone was. I think probably most people know here it's a, it's a drug that's used for opiate addiction. It's a mix of an antagonist and an opioid-like uh, drug so that you can come off your opioid addiction. It's for treatment. It's a complement, if you will, or parallel to methadone. And at the time on Vancouver Island, if you were in methadone treatment, you had to come from Nanaimo or somewhere up on island to Victoria every day to get methadone. With Suboxone, you could carry. You could carry the drug away. It was in a pill form. And you would be able to live your life, rebuild your life if you had been involved in serious opiate addiction, hold down a full-time job, not have to get on the road, and drive down to Victoria every day. And Tony Clement said no. And he almost said no because she wanted to shut down the only safe injection site we had in Vancouver. Today, we have 87 safe injection sites across Canada. And that's because the Liberal government said, this is a mental health issue. This is something we need to work on together. They've also put $11 billion into the provinces and the territories to deal with mental health and to help them put the programs and the supports in place to help youth, to help people who are fighting addiction, and to help the general population, as well as one of the great campaigns, and Mike Wilson, who was uh, a Conservative member of Parliament uh, under, Mike, uh, under Brian Mulroney, who was actually Finance Minister, and sadly lost his son to suicide, he worked with the Liberal government to put forward a campaign to raise awareness about the importance of mental health Thank and you. to normalize Thank you. Thank you. it. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone actually answered the question, so to speak, uh, but I'm, I'm going to do my best. So maybe it's because I'm the only person who's worked in mental health and addictions for over a decade in Victoria, and I've actually seen the issue uh, of people struggling with mental health and addictions on the street probably uh, increase tenfold while the services actually decrease to support those people in need. Uh, you know, to be perfectly honest, we've lost addictions counselors. Uh, we have gotten about uh, an extra five beds uh, for people for treatment. And in most cases, uh, we actually have turned beds into office spaces uh, for the management of mental health and addictions, the bureaucracy of it, rather than actually serving people struggling with these issues, looking for treatment. And I, I think that's really unconscionable, actually, um, because I've, you know, I've, I've worked with people who have died uh, due to the opioid crisis, and what I've seen is uh, purely reactive measures from the province and, and from government. More teams, which, which they do great work, but at the end of the day, they're basically pushing people around this funnel into a very, very narrow hole that it, that, of services that, that just cannot keep up with the demand. That the money, the 60, 70 million dollars that went into the opioid crisis, where does that go? It goes into harm reduction immediately, but that's not the preventative kind of long-term uh, commitments that we need from government. We need to transform our actual healthcare system to not just be about physiological uh, health problems. They need to be about psychological health problems as well. We need psycho psychological services, not just psychiatrists, which, which push pills on people, but actually psycho uh, psychologists 
as treatment methods um, built into the structure of our universal healthcare system. Without that, we're only really treating half our body and in, in turn half our society. So I, I really need, need us to go back to providing the, those psychological services because there are so there, there's one place in Victoria, the Men's Trauma Center, for for example, um, that that is the only place, as far as I know, still in North America, who actually uh, services uh, 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 men who have suffered from any kind of trauma, and that's one place in North America. It, you know. So much of this comes from trauma being passed through generation after generation, um, and men are a big part of that. And of course, women are a huge part of that as well. And but more often than not, uh, they are on the, the, the uh, you know receiving end of that rather than uh, the, the giving end. Although you know that's a whole other conversation we can have. Anyway, I just want to say that the ba basic principle is that we need. Uh, a, a, Complete reimagining of our healthcare system as um, as an actual healthcare system and not just a reactive treatment system. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. I want to thank all of our speakers. Thank you for, very much for participating and sharing your priorities and answering questions. Thank you to the audience for their wonderful questions. The next talk of talk is going to be on October 17. Historian Arabella Bet-Schlimon from University of Washington will give a talk on ethnicity and conflict in Iraq's oil city, a history of Kirkuk. Oh, totally yeah. different topic. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. Please follow City Talks. <laughs>